And then during the Khilafah of Abu Bakr, a great name came onto the scene. And this name remains until the Khilaf of Umar radiallahu anhu. This name is Al-Muthanna. Al-Muthanna ibn Haritha radiallahu anhu. Wa ardahu min al-tabi'een. He's not from the Sahaba. He's from the Tabi'een. Al-Muthanna ibn Haritha is a Iraqi. He was the one during the lifetime of Abu Bakr who encouraged Abu Bakr to begin entering into Al-Iraq. And Al-Muthanna, he was the one who was most knowledgeable of the lands of Iraq, the geography of it, the different areas, where to attack, what to do. He had the most history of fighting with the Persians. The Muslimin prior to it had no history of fighting with the Persians. And you're talking here about one of the two most powerful armies that were around that time. Persia, Romans. And the Muslimin had no history of fighting with them. And during this time, yani this wasn't the only front that the Muslimin were fighting on. The Muslimin were still fighting at that time in Asham, in Egypt, and all of this is going on. But just now we're focusing on Iraq. Once we finish from Iraq, we'll move on to Asham. Al-Muthanna, he had history. So he was placed in Al-Iraq. Who was appointed as the leader of the armies of Iraq at the time of Abu Bakr? None, none other than Khalid bin Walid. Khalid bin Walid radiallahu anhu, he was the initial one who entered into Iraq. But Khalid bin Walid radiallahu anhu, after he had finished in Iraq, he was needed elsewhere. So he had to travel from Iraq to Asham. And with the trust of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Khan Walid radiallahu anhu, he left Al-Iraq in the hands of Al-Muthanna. And he went from Iraq to Asham. During that time when he reached to Asham and he had to help the armies in Asham, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anhu, he passed away. He passed away in Medina on the 22nd of Jumad al-Akhirah, the 13th year after the Hijrah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and he was buried next to his beloved one in his dunya. He was buried next to the Prophet, peace be upon him. And the Khalifa Umar radiallahu anhu took over. From the first things that Umar radiallahu anhu he took over is that he encouraged the Muslimin to travel to Al-Iraq to join the forces there. And he stood up in Medina and he made the call out the first day. The first day, no one answered, no one got up. The second day, he got up. And he encouraged the Muslimin. Second day, no one answered also. Third day, the same thing. Fourth day, a man gets up by the name of Abu Ubaid al thaqafi And he says, I will go, Umar, and I will take with me whoever comes from my tribe. And whoever comes with me from my family, from my relatives. So he was the first person to stand up. And as you know, in a situation like this, why didn't the people stand up? The people were scared. The people there were scared. None of them wanted to go to Persia, not knowing what they're facing, facing an empire. So the people, they're on edge. So as soon as Abu Ubaid, he gets up, another man by the name of Salit, also from a famous tribe, he stands up and he says that I will also go and fight. And whoever comes with me from my companions and from my people and from my tribe. So these were the two men who first got up and then everyone after that started to get up and joined the army that Umar was preparing to send to Iraq. He appointed Abu Ubaid al thaqafi He said that he will be the Amir. He's the first one to get up even though he wasn't a Sahabi and amongst the army that got up and who wanted to go to Iraq later on was Sahaba. And then he advised this Amir. He said to him, listen to the companions of the Prophet Let them have a say in what you are doing. Do not rush into decisions, rather take your time. For war cannot be led except by a man who takes his time in making decisions and who knows the right time to move. 
Nothing prevented me from appointing Salih, but his hastiness. Salih was more known for his army conduct. But the only reason he didn't appoint Salih, because Salih used to be hasty. He says, you are going to a land of treachery, betrayal and oppression. To the land of Persia. You are going to people who are audacious in committing evil and know it well. They have forgotten good and become ignorant of it. The people of Persia. So see what you will do, watch what you say and do not disclose your secrets for so long as the one who has a secret and is keeping it, he will be safe. But if he does not keep the secret, that will cause his destruction, that will cause his doom. So Abu Ubaid al-Thaqafi, he begins to mobilize his troops towards Al-Iraq. Who's leader in Iraq? Al-Muthanna. And the letter is sent to Al-Muthanna when Abu Ubaid al-Thaqafi arrives in Al-Iraq to hand over leadership to him. So this was the second time in the life of Al-Muthanna that he is appointed leader or he is leader and then his, the leadership is given to someone else. First time was given to Khalid Walid. Second time Abu Ubaid al-Thaqafi is coming to give him. In all of these, both of these times Al-Muthanna is more than happy to listen to the orders of the Khalifa. And Abu Ubaid, he came towards Al-Iraq and he had with him 7,000 soldiers and then he added to them over three or four thousand soldiers so by the time he reached to Al-Iraq he had over ten thousand soldiers with him Abu Ubaid al-Thaqafi for the Muslimin this is a large number for the Persians and the Romans in the Byzantines this is a small number but as we always know the Muslimin always look at the quality Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he says clearly in the Quran how many times did a small group of people be victorious over a large group of people by the order of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So as soon as Abu Ubaid al-Thaqafi he reaches to Al-Iraq, word reaches to Persia before he even reaches there and three armies are sent out from Persia. So the first army which is called the Battle of Al-Namariq. In the 13th year of Hijrah, when Abu Ubaid he first reached to Iraq, what the Persians wanted to do, what Kisra wanted to do, is he wanted to frighten Abu Ubaid. This new leader is coming to Iraq, sent by Khalifa Umar. So the first thing that he wanted to do was to put the fee in the heart of Abu Ubaid. The first thing that happens when you reach to Iraq, Abu Ubaid, I'm going to attack you. Not with one army, with three armies. But what they don't know is that the heart of Abu Ubaid is full of Iman. So as soon as Abu Ubaid al-Thaqafi he reaches to Al-Iraq and three armies are sent out from Persia. One army to face him from the front, one army to face him to go from the behind and another army to give assistance to them. And there were three battles that were fought. And this goes back to the intelligence of Al-Muthanna and the intelligence of Abu Ubaid. Because instead of those three armies getting together and fighting the Muslimin, which would have given them a bigger chance of victory, each of the armies hastened to stand off against the Muslimin, and in that hastiness, as Umar radiallahu anhu he mentioned, was their destruction. And the leaders of the army of the Persians, they ran away. And they ran away to the next army that was waiting for the Muslimin, that was the nephew of Kisra. And when they went to there, the Muslimin were able to also defeat the Persians at that area. And then they continued into the battle of Kaskar. And this continued also, Abu Ubaid al-Thaqafi continued with that army after those who had fled and they sought refuge in the city of Kaskar. And when they reached the city of Kaskar, which was the nephew of the Kisra as we mentioned, he went there and he defeated them and acquired a great deal of beauty of war and food. In that area, that area there, there was a type of fruit that the farmers in that area were prohibited from going near. So when the Muslimin, they entered and they freed the areas, the first thing they did was they took those fruits and they distributed to all the farmers who were around. And then when they brought for Abu Ubaid, they brought him food. They said, this is food from a delicacy of our area. He said, okay, did you get enough for the whole army? He says, when you get for the whole army, then you bring the food for me. There's no difference between me 
in my army. My army eats, then I eat. My army doesn't eat, then I don't eat. And this was the understanding of Abu Ubaid al Thaqafi, rahimahullah ta'ala. Even to the extent where two leaders during that battle and the battle before it, two leaders of the Persians were uh, captured by one of the soldiers of the Muslimin. And the soldier of the Muslimin didn't know who he, had, who he had captured. So that prisoner, when he realized that, okay, he doesn't know that I'm one of the leaders of the Persians, I'll make a deal with him. That I'll do such and such, and this is permitted in Islam, to make a deal with the prisoner of war. So when he made that deal and he came to Abu Ubaid, Abu Ubaid, that's the, that's the leader of the armies, one of the leader of the armies. He goes, I made a deal with him. And then even though he was the leader of that army, Abu Ubaid, he said, we have to live by the word of that soldier and the treaty that he had given to that man. He set him free. Based upon the treaty of a normal soldier. Why? To honor. To honor the word of the Muslim. The last battle that took place with these armies was in a place called Al-Barusma. Also in the 13th year of Hijrah. And this was the last confrontation with these armies by Abu Ubaid al thaqafi and they were two cousins of Nasri, the nephew of Kisra. The commonality in the battles during the time of Umar is that they were all very intense. Because the reward for it is so high. After the intense fight that he had with the Persians, he defeated the Persians. The first three battles that he was faced with and he was able to destroy them. Instead of those three armies gathering together and fighting the Muslimin, each of them went separately and they were all destroyed separately. The next battle that Abu Ubaid, he went was the uh, Abu Ubaid's battle of the bridge, which was, yani, the main factor of it was the bridge. When the leader of the Persian army, he fled from the Muslimin, the Persians regrouped and gathered around Rustum, who was the leader of the Persians at that time. And he mobilized a very large army. And just a bit of history, because this is important. At this time, Kisra, Kisra had died. And there was no legal inheritor for Kisra. Because Rustum and the people who were around him, the 17 brothers that he had, were taken out. So that no one, because they they follow the kingship, the legacy. If the male, if Kisra dies, the second male in line takes over. So they got rid of all the male inheritors of the empire of Persia. So who took run or ruling of Persia was Rostam and Feyrazan, who was the wife of Kisra. She took the uh, leadership of the people and he was given the leadership of the armies. And they split the leadership between them. So Rustam, he was the leader of the armies. So they gathered around Rustam. So he mobilized a large army in the leadership of Bahman. And this leader was sent to an area in which the Muslimin had gathered on one side of the river and they gathered on the other side of the river. You, the one thing you have to remember is that the Persians is an empire that had been around for many years. So they had numbers. They had weapons, they had storage, they had everything. And this is an empire that was fighting the Byzantine, the Roman Empire. So they were prepared, they were very well prepared. So if when we say here, gathered a large army, this is something simple to them. Or this was something that they've been preparing for, for many years. And that person or that leader was given what was known as the Great Flag, which was made out of tiger skin and was 5-10 meters wide, 5-10 meters long. And they used to use it as a means of putting fear in the hearts of those who opposed them. So the two armies, they meet on one of the rivers. Between that river, there's a bridge. The Persian leader, he sends to Abu Ubaid, either you cross to us or we cross to you. Abu Ubaid, so he made the decision, even though Al Muthanna and other Muslimin had advised him otherwise, but he made the decision to cross the bridge. 
It's a big bridge. But when they cross the bridge, imagine 10,000, 15,000 soldiers crossing a bridge. So when they reach to the other side, now it's become tight. And then you have the vast, the big army in front of you. And the Persians were known for what? The Persians were known for their elephants. They'll have big bells on them. And the reason or the purpose of these elephants and bells was to what? To feed the horses or to scare the horses so that the horses don't come close. So the Muslimin, they crossed over the bridge. The first thing that comes in front of them are the elephants. And when the horses come close, they see the elephants, they hear the bells, they return. And now what had happened is behind the elephants, you have the arrows and you have the, the spears that are being thrown and a large number of the Muslimin. So here Abu Ubaid al-Thaqafi now, he's looking back and saying, I shouldn't have made that decision. But it's, it's too late. So he called out to the men, get off your horses and fight on your feet. And he centered the attack against the elephants. And the attack was mainly headed towards the elephants, how to disarm them. And how to disarm the people who were on them. So Abu Ubaid, he led the attack against the elephants. But these here you are talking about elephants that have been trained. And Abu Ubaid al-Thaqafi, when he attacks these elephants and he tries to cut off the bells and to cut off the saddles that are on them, he's stuck or he's struck to the ground and he's trampled by the elephant. Death. As he's doing that, Abu Ubaid al-Thaqafi, his wife mentions to him a dream before that. She said, I saw you descending from heaven and your son was with you and your other son and your other son and she mentioned names and those who are or those who you mentioned after me are the ones who will follow me so before the battle of the bridge he had mentioned who is going to be the leader after him so he mentioned himself first and then his son then his other son and then his other son and then those whom he saw in the dream from his family and all of them one after the other had passed away so who takes leadership now Al-Muthanna, the one who is most knowledgeable of Al-Iraq. Al-Muthanna is wise, where he's got the army in front of him, large army, behind him there is a bridge and the Muslimin are being attacked fiercely, he has to make a decision. One man, he gets up from amongst the army, what does he do? He tries to destroy the bridge. He says, after he did destroy a large portion of the bridge, he said, I didn't want the Muslimin to run away. I wanted them to stay firm. There's, there's times where you need to stay firm and there's times where you need to retreat and regather and to reform yourself. So Al-Muthanna, when he saw this, he called this man. He says, why are you doing so? He says, so that the Muslimin don't run away. He says, who gave you the permission to do so? We are trying to retreat the Muslimin. We are trying to turn them back to save them. Because there's no way that we are going to be able to be victorious in this battle. And he slowly begins to retreat. And you have to remember now there is a river. So they are crossing this river and they are retreating. And he made sure that he was the last one. When he made sure that everyone else had retreated, everyone else had turned back, then he returned and he left. Over 4,000 Muslims had passed away. It's nearly half of your army. So they retreated. Al Muthanna, he took control of the army of the Muslimin in Al Iraq. The battle began, there was 10,000 Muslimin. At the end of the battle, there was 5,000. 5,000 had lived. 2,000 of those 5,000 returned to Medina and the areas that they were in. So Al Muthanna was left with 3,000 fighters. So as soon as the news reached to Umar radiallahu anhu that the Persians had defeated the Muslimin in this battle that Al-Muthanna, he retreated and he was able to save as much as he can. Umar radiallahu anhu, he immediately sent reinforcements. From those whom he sent was Jalil ibn Abdullah, Al-Banjali radiallahu anhu, the famous companion. 
and his people with him and many other tribes Umar radiallahu anhu he gathered them and he sent them towards he sent them towards and Muthanna radiallahu anhu who was able to mobilize his army mobilize his people together prepare the people for the next stage because it's not going to end there each person each leader is preparing for the next step and the Persian army gathered again a army in which they sent towards Al Buwayb. And Al Buwayb is also settled on a river. In Iraq, there's two famous rivers, Dajla and Furat. So, this area, Al Buwayb, and an army always tries to gather where there's what? Where there's water. So, Al Muthanna, anhu, he waited for these reinforcements to come. And he waited for the Persians as he had already sent spies and he had already sent out eyes to see what's happening with the Persians. So when the news reached Al Muthanna that the Persian armies were gathering, he sent the letter to Jarir ibn Abdullah and the army that was with him, meet me at Al Buway as the Persian army is gathering and is marching towards the Muslimin. So Al Muthanna radiallahu anhu he reached to the area of Al Buway and Jalil ibn Abdullah came after him and joined the army of Al Muthanna. And this was also in the 13th year of after the Hijrah of the Prophet in the month of Ramadan. When the armies had come and each one was on the other side of the river. So Al Muthanna he waited. So the word was sent to Al Muthanna you either cross over to us or we cross over to you. Al Muthanna said, No, you come and cross over to us. We're not going to make the same mistake twice, not going to make the same mistake as Abu Ubayy. So the Persian army, which was over 15, 20,000, crossed over to meet the armies, to meet the soldiers of the Muslimin in the leadership of Al Muthanna. Al Muthanna has organized his army. He says to them, he gives out the order. I will make takbir three times. The fourth takbir, you attack. So Al Muthanna radiallahu anhu, he makes the first takbir. When he makes the first takbir, the Persian army attacks them. Because after the battle of the bridge and they made the Muslimin retreat, what happened now to the Persians? The, the fear of the Muslimin decreased. So from the first takbir of Al Muthanna, the Persian army attacked the Muslimin and attacked the army of the Muslimin and the war or the fight began. Very fierce, very intense fight between the Muslimin and between the Persians. Now Muthanna radiallahu anhu, he is watching, he is observing. So and Muthanna radiallahu anhu is looking for a weakness within the flanks of the Persian army. You have the right flank, the left flank and then you have the middle. So Muthanna radiallahu anhu, he's observing, he's watching, he sees the leader of the army of the Persian in the middle of the army of the Persians. So he tells the leaders of his army that I'm going to infiltrate, I'm going to push forward in the center. And I'm going to push forward until I reach the leader, you continue fighting on the flanks. And if I'm losing, if we are dying, stay on your areas, continue fighting where you are fighting. And Al Muthanna, he led the group of army in the middle and he attacked the Persians. Because as it's known, that if you're able to take out the leader, then the rest of the army will become weak. So Al Muthanna, he said to Anas ibn Bilal, Oh Anas, if you see me attacking Mahran, who was the leader, join me, join him to my arms and fight with me. And he said likewise to a couple of the other leaders of the Muslim army, radiallahu anhum. So when he attacked Mahran and pushed him towards the right flank and Muthanna continued to put pressure on the army to continue to fight. And weaknesses started to show on the sides of the Muslimin. It's intense, it's, it's, it's fighting. So Al Muthanna radiallahu anhu, after this fierce confrontation is happening, he was able to infiltrate the middle of the army of the Persians. As he's doing so, his brother is... His brother is so he looks back, he sees his brother, he says, don't be weakened by the death of my brother. For verily, he is the one who came to this wishing and wanting for death. 
And if he didn't find it here, he would have found it somewhere else. So don't allow that to weaken you. Let it be a reason for you to push forward even more. So Muthanna radiallahu anhu, he inflicted a large loss. The Muslimin inflicted a large loss on the Persian army. And the Muthanna, he drove a wedge into the core of the Persian army. And from those who infiltrated and penetrated the Persians was Jarir ibn Abdullah al-Bajali radiallahu anhu, one of the famous Sahaba. And they were able to infiltrate, to penetrate the army of the Persians until they reached the leader of that army and he was taken out the rest of the Persian army they ran away and the rest of the Persian army began to turn back and the Muslimin continued fighting what Al-Muthanna radiallahu anhu did is that he got rid of the bridge behind him and this was something that later on he regretted he said I regretted doing so when you corner someone their fighting is going to become more fierce in the battlefield looking at the battlefield Yani, there was over 10,000 of the Persians who were during that battle. And the Muslimin, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He gave them victory in this very important and very monumental battle of al buwayb And this battle changed the view of the Persians towards the Muslimin. The Persians, the change in leadership happened within Persia. Because as we said, it was in the leadership of Rastam and Fayrazan. The blame always goes to who? To leadership. So what happened at that time, the leaders of Persia, they approached Rastam and Fayrazan and they said that there's something that needs to be changed. So now the Persians, they want to find a new leadership. No one is found. Until after the search goes on, they find a son of the brother of Kisra. And he is appointed as the leader of the Persian Empire, yes, Dajrid. And he was appointed as the leader of the Persian armies and all the Persian Empire gathered behind him. And when he became leader, because he is a inherit, he is from the lineage of yani, the family of Kisra, even though it's the son of his brother, but he is a legal inheritor of the empire of Kisra. So when he was appointed as the leader, the enthusiasm of the Persian people increased. To the extent where and all of this news is already with the Muslimin. So when this news reaches Al Muthanna and the people around the areas in which Al Muthanna and the Muslimin had made treaties with them, when they heard of this news, they all broke the treaties with the Muslimin and joined with the Persians again. So now a large amount of land that the Muslimin had taken over is taken back again. So Al-Muthanna radiallahu anhu, he begins to what? He begins to retreat, he begins to return back. And the news reaches to Umar radiallahu anhu. So Umar radiallahu anhu, this was during the what? During the month of Dhul Qi'dah. So Dhul Qi'dah, everyone now in the Arabian Peninsula is preparing for Hajj. So as the people are preparing for Hajj, Umar radiallahu anhu, he sends out the word. He sends out the khutaba the men of poetry, gather the people to join the army of Al-Muthanna, to join the army of Al-Iraq. And everyone begins to march towards there and Umar, he advises Al-Muthanna to retreat. And the two armies begin the preparations for the greatest and the biggest battle that took place with the Persians, which is known as the Battle of Al-Qadisiyah.